Everything I'm going to talk about is uh, joint work with Jacob Fox and uh, Hoi Fox. <laughs> okay, it's actually one of a sequence of papers that we've been writing about subset sums, but uh, before I actually get to subset sums, let me uh, talk about at least one of the motivations for for looking at this particular topic, which is the following problem of uh, Erdős and Strauss from 1968. Okay, so uh, the question is the following. Let's uh, call a set, uh, a set of integers, uh, non-averaging, if no element of A is an average of two or more other elements of A. Okay, so if you have the same condition, but without the or more, uh, then it's just rough. Uh, so, the main difference here somehow is that you're allowing many possible elements and you're allowing A to be the average of, of many elements of A. Of course, if for Roth's theorem, there's spectacular progress just in the last couple of weeks. Um, but this, the methods are very different in what I'm going to talk about. Okay, this is not a problem, this is a definition. So, so what is H of N? The size of the largest non-averaging subset of one of them. So, like I said, this question goes back to the late 60s. Um, it's actually stated in a paper of, of Strauss, but Erdős had asked a, an earlier problem about when you have a non-dividing set, which is the same definition except no element of A should divide the sum of some other elements of A. Um, the problems are fairly closely tied as well. All right, so, so what's now? Let me start with uh, saying a little bit about the, the lower bound. So the lower bound, um, originally, so if you look at Strauss's paper, um, then Strauss actually showed that H of N is at least this, some sort of bound of, of bare end type. Uh, but it turns out that's nowhere near sharp, and actually there are polynomial bounds. So this is Strauss from about 1970. Um, Abbott in 1975 showed that actually it is polynomially larger than, uh, or it is a polynomial size. Uh, essentially these constructions, and I guess this sort of suggests that it might be a bare end type, the constructions are, are roughly of some sort of bare end type. So this was Average 1975. And the best that's actually known uh, up to this point, uh, and it's still the best known, is a result from 89 by Bosnay, uh, which gives a quarter. This is 1989. The paper is two pages long. Um, it's a very, very simple construction. In fact, I can just write it here. Um, so. The example is basically just a parabola. So um, you take an appropriate parabola, so the set of i q cubed plus i plus one choose two, such that i is one, two, up to q minus one, is a non averaging subset. N with n equal q to the four. So you have q elements um, from one up to q to the four, and it's pretty. If you first basically show it in two dimensions with some equivalent thing in two dimensions is not averaging, and then you project it down, and then it works out pretty straightforward. <laughs> Yes. You said type, this says the opposite, right? Like, yeah, it's sort of coming from the bottom up, but you see constructions like this 
in various places. Right, so, yeah. <clears throat> um, and actually, the the kind of method comes from the same kind of argument. Um, okay, uh, for the upper bound, so, so Erdish and Strauss uh, had a paper in 71, I think, and they looked at a related function, which they called capital H of n. And capital H of n is the largest m such that there are two, sub, uh, two sets to subsets of one to m, one to n, each of size m, where no sum of elements of distinct elements in the first set equals uh, a sum of elements in the second set. So, so basically, you're trying to avoid two sets that have subsets that add up to the same thing. And what they actually showed, so there's a fairly simple argument um, due to Strauss that shows that uh, this is an upper bound for non-averaging. So, so they showed that this H of n, the thing we're actually interested in, um, is at most this big H of n, and that big H of n is at most f the two thirds. So, so this is tradition Strauss. Um, uh, so. Okay, um, that was subsequently improved. Um, in fact, all the improvements uh, go through, sort of factor through this thing. So, so first you have H of n is less than or equal to this big H of n is less than or equal to, to this, um, which is a result of Erdős and Sharpezi from about minus one. Uh, and then much more recently, there's a result by myself and uh, Jacob Fox and Hoi Fong in a different paper that gets it to, to root. So this is myself, Fox, and Fong, and that's uh, Stone process. <clears throat> Okay, um, why did I go through all of this? Because this is in essence the, the strongest you can do from this approach. The actual answer for, for this particular question is actually root n up to some constant. So, so forgetting about the, the uh, non-averaging problem, this thing root n is the correct thing. Um, okay, but the thing that I want to actually aim towards in this lecture and say a little bit about is that we do have an improvement uh, now, which goes below this one half of the square root, which has the strange exponent root two to the minus one. So, so this is another paper by myself, Fox and Baum, that hasn't quite appeared yet, but will hopefully be on, on archive in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so <clears throat> this is where I want to get to. I'm now going to totally change to something totally different, and I'll come back to this in the end. So what I actually want to talk about is uh, subset sums. So a given uh, set A, I guess it doesn't really matter what group it's contained in. Um, so given a subset of the natural numbers, it's set of subset sums. is uh, sigma of a, which is a set consisting of, you take uh, the sum over all s in some big S of little s, such that s is a subset of a. So, so you look at all two to the a uh, subsets of, uh, of a, and you add up all the elements. If you have the null set, you just get zero. So you're allowing zero to be here. And so this is a sort of relative, in some ways, the basic object of additive combinatorics is just taking some sets, A plus B or A plus A. This is uh, a different object, but also 
uh, a fairly basic one. So what kind of things can you say about this? Or what kind of things can you say about the structure here? One of the basic things you can say is, so uh, a theorem of Semeradian Vu, which goes as follows. So we'll just Semeradian Vu from 2006. Uh, says that so there exists some positive constant c such that uh, if a is a subset of one up to n with a of size at least big c times root n then sigma of a contains a long ap so it's an arithmetic regression of length at least. So, so somehow, and so root n is a critical thing here. So um, as you go below root n, the behavior of long AP is actually changes. Um, so above root n, the sort of length you get is the square of the size of the set. And below root n, it's some, some different behavior. So um, results. Similar results go back to the 60s and results of Erdős and Folkman, but, but this is sort of the, the end of the line in terms of when do you get a, an AP, sorry, arithmetic is obviously an arithmetic progression. Okay, and uh, actually one of the earlier results, which is a weaker result, uh, let me state it anyway. Uh, so it's a result of Freiman and Charcozy. independently from uh, 1993, which says, okay, so there exists some C. The statement looks extremely similar, such that if A is a subset of 1 to N with uh, A now, it's very slightly larger, so it has size c square root n log n. Then a contains sigma of a as homogeneous arithmetic progression of like that. Okay, so. What's the difference here between an ordinary arithmetic regression and a homogeneous arithmetic regression? Well, uh, an AP is homogeneous if, uh, let's call it, it's, it equals A, A plus D, A plus K minus 1B, where D divides A and hence up. The instinct here is that you're a homogeneous AP. If when you extend it out to the, the full AP going to plus and minus infinity, it actually goes through zero. Uh, okay, so it's a specific type of AP or it has some nice modular constraint. All right. Um, several people asked whether it's possible to actually cross these, these two things. So Erdős and uh, Vu and uh, Sharkozy and so on asked whether there is a common refinement of the two. So uh, a theorem, again, by myself, uh, Jacob Fox and Toy Fon, uh, and the, the first paper I mentioned up there, actually proves this. So uh, gives a common refinement. So what I mean by that is that uh, a greater than or equal to c root n implies a homogeneous. All right, so, and the, the motivation for this was that it has several consequences. So one of the consequences is what I've already mentioned, uh, is that it actually shows, so, uh, 
uh, applications. So the first application is, is this thing that um, it uh, gives a tight bound. And the second thing is that it also gives an exact bound a problem of uh, Alan and Erdish. So GNN, which is the largest subset of one of them without uh, a subset sum adding to exactly it. So it's a sort of extremal problem for subset sums. And that went back to the 80s and very various different results that have been proved about approximations to the true answer. Okay, but again, I'm not gonna say a huge amount about these things because what I actually wanna talk about is high dimensional generalizations of uh, this kind of result. So. So, uh, so in order to state some sort of high dimensional generalization of this thing, uh, let me just define, I'm sure everybody here probably knows what it is, but define what a gap is. So, so uh, generalized arithmetic regression or gap of dimension D. Form. Okay, so Q is equal to set of X plus the sum from I equals one to D, NI times QI, such that NI, each of the NIs range over some, some number of stuff. Okay, so, so this is an arithmetic, or generalized arithmetic regression, dimension D, initial term X, and the differences are the, the QI. And we also can say that uh, that this is homogeneous if so the instinct should be the same. Essentially, if you extend it out in all directions, it should you form the, the sort of the lattice, then it should go through zero. And um, but uh, if the GCD of Q1 up to QR divides X. <clears throat> so, um, so where do these things actually intersect? What's happening here? Well. This says that you get some structure. If you're above root n, you're guaranteed to get a long arithmetic regression. What happens if you go below root n? Maybe you can still get some structure? Um, and you can, but it tends to change in form. And the way it changes is encapsulated in this other result of Samaradi and Boo, which is also from a different paper, um, which says, okay, so, so for every k, and there are big C and little c such that if um, A is a subset of one of them with uh, A large, so now large just means that it's larger than n to the one over k. Then for some uh, D less than or equal to k minus one, there is a d-dimensional sigma of a contains a uh, d-dimensional gap of size at least c times a to the d plus. Okay, so, so basically what it's saying is that you contain uh, not necessarily an arithmetic regression, 
but you contain arithmetic regression or maybe some gap of some other dimension. So actually, let's do the the uh, k equals three case. So for example, yeah. Um, so you have some um, bounds relating to how, so like if you, instead of taking the sigma A, like which is all some sets, yeah. all, like if you just take K length or something and how, how long you get. Yeah, so typically speaking, um, so for a lot of these results, you can make do by taking a short number, but the short number will still be logarithmic in n or something like that. And logarithmic in n will provide you with a length n? It provides you, so I'm not sure about here. So certainly in this kind of situation, you can get essentially everything. And I suspect we can do the same here, but we'd need to. Yeah, I suspect you can do the same there, but I don't quote me on that. I'd have to check, so. Um, uh, all right, so. For uh, k equals three, we get either um, an AP of length uh, C A squared or uh, or a two AP, two D AP of uh, size C A. Uh, okay, and either of these possibilities, they're both possibilities um, and you can't rule out either of them actually happen. All right. Um, so once we actually have this kind of result, the next question then is probably, um, well, I was just talking about homogeneous extensions of this. This, this doesn't guarantee, or this doesn't guarantee any homogeneity. So uh, maybe we can actually take this and prove a homogeneous version. And, and that is, uh, one of the main results of, of our paper. So, yeah. so the same result holds. Same results, but now with homogeneous gaps. Okay, and uh, and basically a lot of the reason for this is that or that we developed this is it has this application to non-averaging sets, but it also has other applications that we're also still still working. All right. Um, as it happens, at least technically, this result saying that you know if you're above n to the one over k, you get some d-dimensional gap of a certain size within sigma of a, um, is not really the the main result. I keep saying this, but um, but the actual real result is is this thing, which looks a bit more complicated. But I'm going to try and do my best to motivate you and tell you where it comes from. So again, this is myself, Jacob Fox, and Python. Okay, so uh, for any beta greater than one and eta between zero and one, there are C and D such that and follow. So for any uh, A contained in one of them with uh, A equals M greater than or equal to N to the one over beta, there are uh, a second board. Uh, there are some A hat contained in A, which is pretty large actually. So um, so it has size fairly close to A. Uh, 
right, let me actually modify the statement very slightly. I need for later use, I need an S here as well. And any S between M to the eta and uh, CM over log M. There are. Okay, so uh, some A hat contained in A with A hat close inside A. And a gap P. Gap e of dimension D containing this A hash union zero and uh, for any sorry, uh, some A prime contained in A hash such that uh, sigma of A prime contains CSP, uh, and that's it actually. Okay. So, so I started with a set A and I've ended up with three different sets, A, A hat, and A prime. And uh, I should say that this uh, P is proper as well. Uh, actually, I want a stronger thing, this thing's proper. So, but for now, in thinking about this result, it's actually better to not think about this A, A hash and A prime as being different. Um, so just, just think of them as being all the same. This is some approximation to it. And, and this here, um, A prime equals S, such that this is the case. Okay. Um, so what it's saying, if you assume that they're all the same, is it's saying, okay, so you take some set, there's some gap such that the gap contains A and the uh, set of subset sums of A actually contain, uh, contain the right multiple of P. Within sigma of A prime, because A prime has size S, you're adding up S things. And this is saying that if you add up S things within here, you're actually just picking up all the elements within this gap. You're sort of, Sandwiching from both sides, what's actually happening? So, CSP means that it's some set or iteration. Sorry, CS the CSP is uh, some set. Yeah. It actually, if you're dealing with proper regressions, it doesn't really make much difference if it's some sort of like multiple of the box. But yeah. yes. So the uh, the sort of way to think about this is that uh, S times P is an approximation for, for this sigma of A. I mean, more correctly for this sigma of A prime. So on the one hand, we're saying that sigma of A prime contains this, this CSP. And on the other hand, uh, so it's clear that uh, sigma of A prime is actually contained in S times P because there are S elements within here. So I'm adding at most S things and A prime is contained within P. So when I'm adding them up here, sort of. <clears throat> and the lemma is telling you that the result says that sigma of A prime actually contains CSP. Um, okay, so again, I'm being a little bit woolly. So um, really what it does is it tells you that you contain a translate. Um, but essentially, from, from the point of view of what's actually happening, it feels like you're, you're taking the subset sums and approximating it by, um, by a large subset of, of a, a gap. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, what else do I want to say about this? Uh, so one point that I want to make is that, so it is actually necessary to take a subset A hat. Um, and the sort of instructive example here is, uh, consider what happens if A is uh, M, so one of them, union some element that's much larger, uh, some X, 
where x is much, much larger. If you take the, uh, the subset sum of this thing, uh, this m, forgetting about this for a second, this m will just become a longer arithmetic regression around length m squared. You get this m squared thing, and then you get a shift of that, which gives you another m squared. So you get two of these things. If instead one were to take a, a multifold sum set, you actually get uh, this thing, but then you get loads and loads of copies of it shifted. So it's not really possible to have the, the uh, so, so it's not possible that sigma of A be sandwiched between CSB and SB. So one really does have to do some sort of initial uh, preparing to throw out some bad elements. Essentially, this is the kind of only bad case that there's some, some bad elements that are creating trouble for you, but you do need to chuck those away. Um, the next thing I wanted to say about this is that Yeah. So is this saying that CSP is contained in SP? Uh, yeah, so CSP, it's just, um, you should think of this as just being a smaller integer, the CS. So um, C is just some constant. Uh, so you're thinking of this as being a sum set, but a smaller set. Uh, so C is smaller than one here. C is smaller than okay. one. Yes, I probably should have said that, but yeah, it's, uh, it's smaller than one here. Okay. Um, this is really the, the main result. It does actually imply this statement about uh, that I wrote down a minute ago. Hopefully it's still here. Uh, so, so it implies the statement where you're getting an arithmetic progression or a gap whose dimension is at most k minus one. And it tells you that you contain uh, a long homogeneous. So, um, Okay, so uh, so the fact that this p contains zero actually means that it's homogeneous. So, so it contains a homogeneous progression. Sigma a prime contains an even longer homogeneous progression. You can actually force it to be homogeneous. I haven't said too much about it. And then there are reductions that allow you to take a homogeneous progression and make it longer. So, so to get the uh, homogeneous Samurai Vu, one has to, one takes the uh, long homogeneous progression CSP and extends it. Okay, so, um, so if this is one dimensional, this is actually very easy. So a homogeneous progression in one dimension is essentially some multiple of an interval. So you can sort of divide it down to an interval. And then if you have an interval and you add elements, you have a long interval and you add an extra element, all it does is extend the interval and making it longer. And you can repeat that to get a very, very long interval. If you have a d-dimensional gap, you can't really do that. You can actually, adding elements could change the dimension of the gap, so on. So actually it's easier to lift it um, to uh, essentially a convex body over ZD, and then to use a result of, of tau and vu, a discrete John type theorem to pass back and forth between the two. Okay, so, so I want to say a little bit about how this works before going back to non averaging sets. There's a lot of different ingredients to the proof. Is your is the basic strategy that you just keep a few elements of the original set A in your hand and then uh, at the end and that's how you extend or is this that's not the way it extends? Yeah, so for this, yes, the basic strategy is you keep some elements in your hand to use them to extend. That part is not that hard actually. It's sort of the the, the hard part is really it's really this. Okay. Um, okay, so I said that's the proof strategy. So uh, the first thing is to sort of 
pre-process this egg. Um, so uh, by chipping away some bad elements, uh, removing bad elements to get a stable subset A prime. Uh, stable. So the actual properties we need are a little bit more complicated, but essentially what I mean by stable here is that if you look at uh, the smallest d-dimensional gap that contains this thing, it's fairly stable. So if I chuck away some elements from here, then uh, the resulting box that contains, the smallest box that contains those, uh, that set with a few elements removed is very close to the one for the whole box. Um, and that's sort of inspired by this uh, example I had a minute ago. We've had an arithmetic progression element that's much larger. Um, so the smallest one-dimensional AP containing just one of 10 is just one of 10. But if you're going to cover that much larger element, you have to do something much larger. You need the, the full sweep of the thing. Um, whereas what we actually need is something where, uh, where it's much better behaved with respect to, to containment. Okay, so, um, and one can do that by a fairly standard density encoder. Uh, the second thing, which is uh, much simpler and very familiar to people in extremal and probabilistic combinatorics, is you now randomly partition this hash into sets uh, A1 up to AL with similar properties. That's somehow a key thing that when we actually take random subsets, the random subsets are also stable in, in the kind of senses that we had in the first time. So uh, the third part, which uh, starts to get a bit harder is uh, for each of these AIs, find a, a subset AI prime with uh, AI prime of size roughly S over L, such that sigma of AI prime is greater than or equal to some constant times uh, S over L. A hash. So I already want to find some set that has the property that um, if I take the subset sums, I'm actually covering, or at least in size, I'm much larger than, or around the same size as S over L times A hat. So the, the actual, um, again, this is just the ordinary subset sum. Okay, so. Uh, this involves some iterative process where you have some kind of like what Freddie was saying, you have some set of elements, you're picking out elements that are good and good enough to expand your, your subsets all over time. Um, the actual details of it uh, involve quite a lot of work to make sure that there is an element available that expands your set of subset sums at each set. We also need uh, a result saying that, okay, so there is a, a gap P uh, uh, yeah, so there's a gap P containing A actually to zero. Such that actually this S over L in zero is, is dense in, in SP. So, um, so, and that this thing is proper actually. S over L. And, uh, S over L B. So um, what is going on here? So I'm saying 
there's a gap containing this a hash. That's a fairly standard move coming from Prima. But essentially, that gap should also be such that if I take the sum set of this thing, you shouldn't lose much room. It should still be that actually the, the manifold subset of this thing is still a fairly large subset of the manifold subset of this thing. Uh, and again, there's actually an approximation going on here. So uh, the real thing going on underneath this is that um, for any of there is this P such that um, SP approximates S. So actually, um, he, there's, a, there's an arithmetic progression which looks very, very like the manifold subset of this, this set A. Ultimately, this is an application of Freiman's theorem, but it's, it's quite delicate and unique. Okay, so if you put together this and, and this, then you end up knowing that actually uh, this set sigma of AI is quite dense in, in SP. So this implies uh, this sigma of AI prime is dense. That means in uh, S over L. All right. Um, so that's just a combination of, of this and this. At this point, this is true for I equals one up to L. So in the one dimensional case, what you have, for example, is you have some long AP, and then you have a bunch of fairly dense subsets. And if you have a bunch of fairly dense subsets, each of which has density around one over L, and you take L of them and you take the sum set, it turns out that you contain a, a long arithmetic progression. In fact, if none of them are contained in some AP, uh, some non-trivial AP, then you actually get a long interval inside here. So the thing that we actually do is we take our dense subsets, we add them up, and we get that actually, and yeah, so, so adding sigma i prime, we get that uh, sigma of their sum a prime contains a uh, required gap. And uh, yes. okay, so. There's actually a lot going on in these various steps, but um, but the basic strategy is is essentially this. Um, uh, so going back to to what I was saying about non-averaging sets, how does this actually impinge on non-averaging sets, and where does this square root of two minus one come from? Okay, so um, so back to uh, All right, so let's assume that uh, so A is a subset of M, and we want to show by induction. That actually A has size at most some um, M to the alpha. So, okay. so that's all right. Uh, root two minus one is actually bigger than a third. It's smaller than a half, but it's bigger than a third. So the conclusion is that we have either an AP or a uh, two-dimensional gap. So we guess either so by result 
get either a homogeneous AP. Um, and I won't go into the numerics here, but you can guarantee that we have length at least X. Um, it turns out that there's some simple combinatorial, combinatorial arguments that if you have a homogeneous arithmetic version of length n, you can force the thing to contain, uh, to be not non-averaging. So it will contain an element, which is the average of some other elements. Um, I, won't, I won't really go into that. The other possibility is that there is a 2D gap, P, and that 2D gap, I'm going to assume uh, and let me just equate all of the a primes and so on. And uh, sigma a contains uh, S P for for a proper. Actually, let me make it M P for a proper progression. Doesn't matter if it's homogeneous here. Actually, uh, yeah. Um, so this second part, assuming that actually your progression contains uh, a large subset like this, is the thing that implies that root two minus one works. So, uh, so let's assume that assume p is a w one times w two gap. It's two dimensions. W one is one of the widths. W two is the other. Then. Uh, since each fiber of our non averaging set A must also be non averaging, induction implies that that actually, so M, which is the size of this set A, is less than or equal to W1 times W2 to the alpha. So, so within each of these fibers, the most elements I can have is W2 to the alpha, which is what I'm trying to do by, by induction. And just a simple uh, analysis, assuming that W1 is less than or equal to W2, this is at most. This is most this. OK, so just to set it aside for a second, that implies that W1, W2 is at least M to the 2 over 1 plus plus. All right, uh, what does this have to do with anything? Well, now I'm going to look at upper and lower bounds on this, this sigma of A. So, so what's happening with upper and lower bounds here? So on the one hand, this uh, sigma of A, by assumption contains this long sum set. So it contains, again, this is only true up to a constant, but it contains this. Thing. This P and indeed MP is a two dimensional gap. So actually uh, this multiplication scales quadratically. So this is actually at least M squared times, times P, which is at least M squared times W1, W2. And by what we've written here, this is at least M squared plus 2 over 1 plus 1. Okay. <clears throat> On the other hand, uh, if you take this sigma of A, these, um, these manifold subsets tend to be fairly well behaved in the sense that sigma of A. I'm adding up at most m elements, each of which come from one up to m. So the total length I can get is, is m times f. That's the best you can possibly do. Um, on the other hand, to begin with, I was assuming that this uh, m here is at least n to the alpha, which implies that actually n, uh, which we don't want to go. Uh, sorry, I should be assuming, let's assume that. A is larger than this. Yeah. And larger than the alpha, which implies that n is less than n to the one. If I put this back in here, and this is less than m to the one plus. Okay, upper and lower bound. 
compare the two, you get some quadratic equation. The result that comes out is uh, that implies contradiction. Yeah. Alpha is less than root two minus one. So right there, the other way around, right? Isn't it? Uh, okay, so that's basically where the number comes out of, but essentially. It's a fairly simple-minded application of this lemma. You need to be a little bit more careful um, because we're dealing not with A, but with this subset A prime, but essentially you lose some log factors um, and you end up with the same thing. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of open problems here, uh, at least if you're looking from the non-averaging perspective, the main open problem is what is the, the real answer here? Um, and I guess I, don't want to speak for my co-authors, but it feels like the right answer is probably the sent to the one quarter. That seems a very natural example, but it seems like extra work is going to be needed beyond what we've done to actually get there. Yeah. Okay, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Do you have any version of your result where the two dimensional gap can be assured to be homogeneous? Uh, so we have a paper that we're working on where you need um, to do with squares and subset sums that we've been talking to Terry and uh, Dimitris Kukalopoulos about, where you do actually need the homogeneous, uh, the two dimensional homogeneous gap. Um, but that's still a work in progress. So I, don't, I don't want to say too much about it. So um, excuse me, the slot skeps that you just did. I don't understand where the term uh, like non-averaging enters into this argument. It doesn't, right? So no, this is a good point. So basically I was avoiding the whole thing. It's it's all here. Very messy. Inductively, that's the case we'll hit at the bottom. Yeah, exactly. So basically what I've proved here forces you to be in the first situation, and then the first situation you actually find the non so, Is it is it clear why? Why the two the basic things. relationship between the subset sums and the and the averaging. I, mean, I can see that if you yeah. add up some things and then you divide by the number that you added up, then you get another number. But maybe ask me after. I can go into it, but it, it would take like half an half an hour again to show. Sure. Sure. More questions. This root two minus one is a funny exponent. You, you don't believe it has a chance to be sharp? Like for <laughs> infinite seed onsets, for example. Yeah, so I know a couple of other places it comes up. It comes up for these infinite seed onset. I, I think it's just that same quadratic comes up arbitrarily. I don't think there's any relation. It's like it'll always have arbitrary numbers. Yeah, that's, that's probably true. exactly it. Uh, I have some results in Ramsey theory as well where it comes up as an exponent. Do you use it all that like the integers are ordered, or could you talk about like non averaging subsets of like C2? This is the argument. Uh, so the arguments as are work quite heavily in the integers, I think. Uh, so one could definitely look at the question, but I think you'll get slightly different. Torsion, I mean, it's trapped in a subgroup. Even that, I assume this is a building stuff. very difficult, like. Yeah, it is all, yeah. 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 Any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank David again.